I'm a great believer it's not official until it's officially denied. And the Hong Kong's de facto central bank, Eddie Yu, said the peg has worked very well for 40 years and there's no plans to change it. And that rang the bell for that very point that Brent made um, about the Swiss National Bank in December just before Christmas saying it was central to their policy and then walking within three and a half weeks. The 14th of January, the peg failed in 2015 uh, after saying in late December 14 that it was central to their policy. So the fact that he has to comment is the indicator, not the content of what he says. He talks his book and and serves his masters. So that content is always going to be in that line. But the fact that he needs to comment is your indicator of stress. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Real Vision. I'm Brent Johnson with Santiago Capital, and I'm coming to you from San Juan, Puerto Rico. And I'm excited to be able to speak today with Francis Hunt, uh, the market sniper who's coming to us from South Africa. And we're going to be talking about a completely different part of the world than where I'm at and where he's at. We're going to be talking about Asia, and we're going to be talking about Hong Kong specifically. Um, without further ado, si, uh, Francis, why don't you give us a quick little background on who you are and what you do, and then we'll get into your presentation. Absolutely. Thank you. And delighted to be here both with yourself, uh, Brent, and with the Real Vision audience. Um, so the market sniper.com, uh, the, we're the founders of the HVF method, a trading methodology. Uh, we're also very focused on the global cycle we find ourselves in, which we call almost reset uh, anomics. Uh, we coin phrases like hyperstagflation and many other things, and we're in the ed, uh, trader education space. Um, but particularly the topic today, I'm really keen to bring in, and I actually asked for this one to be brought forward as a special alert in an essence. However, I do want to uh, highlight that when you're taking on pegs, as we will be doing today and making calls, we've got to remember that this is some the USD Hong Kong dollar peg that we have been uh, we'll be discussing today has been in existence for the better part of 40 years. So people should not treat this uh, a two, uh, they, they should they should recognize this is a very aggressive position uh, to assert. And the, the narrative I'm going to be putting out is that um, we essentially could be in a situation that my guesstimation, allowing time till the end of Q1 2023, I think there's a more than currently priced in chance that we see the USD Hong Kong dollar peg fail. Um, and that's the reason behind why we're going to be having this chat today. Well, great. Uh, this is a, a trade that I've been looking at and have actually had on uh, as well. So I know that we were in agreement uh, in, in what could potentially happen. Uh, looking forward to talking a little bit about more of the details of why we think it could happen and perhaps why now is a higher probability event than, than it has been in the past. So I've kind of got a bit of a reputation of focusing on pegs. I see uh, pegs uh, as being uh, artificial uh, and active manipulation by a big for a bigger force. But long term, I don't think you can build a wall on the beach and hold back the tide. So that I have what I call two previous successful calls. So in the question, why should you care what Francis thinks? Has he got any track record? We've called twice on the same currency pair for breakages and provided timeframes. And we've had a performance to both sets of timeframes. So actually on a two out of two on peg fails, admittedly both on the Euro Swiss franc, uh, another one that um, in terms of Euroland, I know you have very interesting views uh, on as well. The first was at 150. Now this was an unofficial peg in my opinion, but when I dropped on low time frames, to me, in my opinion, it was quite clear that the Swiss National Bank was actively attempting to hold at that time the 1.5 handle. I put on a trade in November and said uh, before the quarter, I expect this level to have been broken for the downside. I went away on holiday to Cape Town um, and I actually checked in two weeks into a long term holiday and it had uh, fallen. And this was the precursor to what became the Greek and later the pigs crisis. That was very, very shortly after uh, the lows of of the great um, financial crash. So that was an unofficial peg. Um, and as I say, the SMB was almost certainly in there. Then there was the far more official one. We're on a monthly time frame, a very lengthy one. Um, and again, we called for by quarter one. It's ironic that these pegs often seem to be, in my view, a- about ready to go in quarter one of a year. I don't know why that might be. It might be coincidence. It might be nothing to it. Uh, but the 1.2 we said would fail on Tips TV when I was working out of the UK. Uh, and that one fell, uh, and that was a hard peg. It was an admitted peg at 1.2, uh, and it fell catastrophically for a number of brokers. 
Those that follow our material will also know we're expecting a 0.71 and possibly sub the sevens on the Euro Swiss franc right now uh, for a different uh, reason, but that's a point of interest. So we have two successful peg fail calls. Uh, you might query the original one, but there's no arguing about um, the second one, which was the events of 2015. Francis, let, let, let me jump in real quick because this is, I think this is important for people that are following along and kind of watching current pegs that are, that are under management. If I remember right, it was within a couple of days or certainly less than a week before the peg failed that the head of the Central Bank of Switzerland came out and publicly said, we are committed to maintaining this peg. So, you know, it's, 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 it's just because you see in a newspaper article quoting some monetary authority saying this is not something you have to worry about it. I would encourage people not to take that as a... Uh, as as gospel from the Lord. So in fact, I would in, I would take it further than that. I would see it. So when that event actually occurred, I I reissued a reassert, and I said by the end of January instead of quarter uh, one. So I actually yeah. cut two months off it. In other words, the fact that they're under stress. And, they, uh, and I actually refer to this in the slide. It's not official until it's been officially denied in one of the points. Absolutely and right. Come up. Uh, and it's totally almost agree. the same. It's a sign of the stress that came out. Uh, so, yeah, so th that's uh, two events re involving pegs, and those are the only two times I've actively got involved. Just for a lot of people that are only just kind of getting into the whole Hong Kong story and China and all of that, a bit of the history, it's been a conduit of capital to Asia in general and more specifically to China. So demand for capital from mainland companies, that's China, has been desperate. Cash need as sword at the moment. However, conduit no more. Hong Kong's ability to provide that capital has dwindled. So much of its status as an Asian financial hub is being uh, undermined. Why is that? That has come as a result of the undermining of the rule of law. And the Hong Kong riots and a lot of this, people have become aware that Beijing can hijack an individual out and take him to face legal proceedings in mainland China. Uh, this has caused a great degree of concern. And as a result, there is a capital flight. And I will make a point why I believe that that is a proven point, which will include the Hong Kong 33 and the Hang Seng. Bank deposits falling. The benchmark Hang Seng is down 40% since 2018. And the eight share index of mainland Chinese equities is below the GFC, the Great Financial Crisis. So imagine if U.S., uh, indices were at that level. Just to give you an idea of the stress and strain and capital fleeing the region. A couple of reasons why uh, there's problems with pegs. The monetary policy is the Fed for a place that's uh, the other side of the planet. You do not have power over your own uh, monetary policy. And you can have a situation exactly as we have where you have America tightening um, and they are in a different stage of the economic cycle and it causes a lot of deflation. So a couple of key points for people's understanding there. Again, for people who are are, are, who are new to this and are trying to learn, um, you can look up a, t uh, a phrase called Triffin's Dilemma. And Triffin's Dilemma is a, is a theory that states whenever an individual country's currency is also used as the global reserve currency, at some point in time, there will come an event where the needs of the domestic economy come into contradiction with the needs of the global economy. And that's exactly what we are seeing right now with much of the world. The U.S. needs to tighten monetary policy um, for domestic issues um, at the same time that the rest of the world does not necessarily need that or, or can necessarily sustain that. And so we, we're, we're kind of right in the heart of Triffin's dilemma, especially with regards to the Hong Kong dollar peg. Sorry, Francis, I'm going to let you go ahead. I just wanted to get that in there. No, 100%. It's, it's, got, it's got to come into it. Um, so just a couple of key points. Uh, what you're seeing above is the Hong Kong uh, 33. This is an ec uh, equity index, popularly known as the Hang Seng. And then this is the peg. Bear in mind, they're in a range band. What we've observed is when you have the macro sell-offs, and I'll hyper-clarify uh, this, the big sell-off there, the line in pink, um, when you have the big sell-offs as you did there, that was the 2008, you can see we moved up. Not a huge amount on the peg, but this was the last really harder. There was a sort of semi-official level there that we've since leaked a little higher on the peg. 
You can see the sell-off on equities there. Again, you can see the USD Hong Kong. So that's the dollar going up and the, the Hong Kong dollar going down with its indice. So that points to not only is the equities being sold, but it's probably foreign direct investment into the equity market and it's fleeing the Hong Kong dollar as well as exiting the equity market. So this is a, a problem when large moves in your equity uh, market are being driven by international sellers. Where I am now in South Africa has had a similar problem and they're very familiar with the uh, concept of flight capital. Big sell-off in 2016. 2016 was very interesting. We had what Jim Rykards referred to as the Shanghai Accord. Uh, in essence, that was when China maxed out on debt. It had created an immense amount of heat uh, in the globe during the GFC when everyone else was as cold as ice. Bought up, sustained Australia immensely. They skipped through the GFC, buying up copper and ore. Then they hit the buffers on being hyper indebted. And there was an unofficial meeting of, I think it was the G8, G10, G20, God knows, of the, the top financial ministers. Uh, and they came out with a plan. Again, as I say, you reach for the top on the sell-off of of the markets. And now we have a shooting star at that point, which was very much the lower band. Uh, and then we've had a sustained sell-off period here, and you've gone right the way up to the high point now. I will, in the next chart, show you what is happening in what I refer to as an inverted HVF structure on the Hong Kong uh, index. Please understand that when you're at the top of this range, on an ongoing and continuous basis, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority is having to sell its USDs to buy back its domestic currency to maintain that peg. So it is burning dollars. Sorry, I'm going to jump in again. I, I'm very glad you brought this up right here, Francis, because, I, again, I, for, for people who are not familiar with the way a currency peg works, they can all be a little bit different. But essentially what they're doing is when, in this case, when U.S. dollars come into Hong Kong, they're exchanged for Hong Kong dollars so that, they, so that capital can be used in Hong Kong. Then the central bank has those dollars either in reserve or, or on tap. Um, they then use those dollars to buy their own currency to artificially make their currency stronger. Um, and so that is the way a peg typically works. And again, they can be uh, arranged slightly differently, um, and, but that's essentially how a currency peg program is structured. Anyway, sorry to interrupt. I'm going to let you get back. Oh, keep coming in. I love it. Um, this move from the one side back down here was the event of 6, .7, uh, 6 to 7 trillion being printed. And it's the only time we've seen such an abrupt sell-off, and it's understandable. So we, the, uh, when that uh, process post-pandemic occurred, we created enough funds for the world not for America uh, specific. So uh, the Fed's role on a global stage can't be underestimated here. Um, so going to the lower down time frame, I'm highlighting the same thing on a, a 10 hour uh, chart, which is a bit peculiar, but I wanted to get the setup in uh, structure. Again, you will see the movement to the top end of the range, and you can see it associated with bearishness on the Hong Kong markets. And there's a reason why I brought it to this time frame, and I'll be showing you in the next chart, because there is a technical squeeze and a breakdown. So on the lower time frames, on the 10 hourly, I'm illustrating that again, that relationship holds regarding flight capital. Shares are sold and the money is going offshore and the dollar is being sold. We're seeing that push up. So the blues are showing you the deval of the Hong Kong dollar against the USD uh, and the sell-offs in the equities are very, very coincident. So these this proves a point of flight capital uh, and uh, money leaving both the equity space in Hong Kong, but also leaving the territory as a whole, which is seeing the pressure come through then on the Hong Kong dollar as well. So with that in mind, uh, I'm now just showing you the Hong Kong dollar on a daily time frame, a more traditional time frame for most people. It's already had a big period of selling off. This structure is a downside continuation structure. This is part of our bespoke methodology that we do. Those that wouldn't want to have a trade that's holding against uh, the FX could actually trade the Hang Seng short. There's no one trying to hold the stock market up. Well, not in the same manner as the Hong Kong Monetary Authority is trying to hold the peg down. Um, but 
that this is a downside trade. If we were to trade from where we are, and this is funnel levels, this red and green lines are in and around the 20,000 zones. We've already triggered this, run our interim target at a small return move. And I talk about five stages of a, a breakdown. So we typically get a very timid step over a level and then a return move. This is early doors when it tests a level. Uh, so stage one, stage two, break and feign, return move. Stage three is the capitulation phrase. It's often very, very quick and brutal. So the exciting bit in terms of fast movement could be coming quite soon. So you could see, again, a move here, small amount of wind up, and then you have a spill, typically from our first interim to at least covering the second interim. So that is quite a lot of loss to the downside that comes. This is going to imply... Given what I've shown, ref flight capital, that this is money exiting, not just the Hong Kong market, but the Hong Kong territory as a whole, it's going to mean that an accelerated rate of dumping dollars by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority in a bid to protect its peg. So not only have they worked at what rate, what glide rate they're at, that glide rate is going to get a lot steeper potentially. And that's going to focus minds immensely in terms of the viability of the peg. For, again, for people who aren't as familiar watching currencies and what can potentially happen, you know, we saw the yen earlier this year lose a lot of value, and it did it in a very steady manner over a number of months. That is not possible with a currency peg. <laughs> you will see the currency peg stay flat for a long time, and then it will just disappear, and you will see a massive move very quickly. It was able to happen that way on the yen because there was no currency peg. Um, but if we're talking about uh, the Hong Kong dollar, um, the fact that it's sitting right at its band level for a very long time shows that without the band, it would be doing exactly what the yen was already did earlier this year. But it's 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 the peg that keeps it flat. Anyway, I'm gonna back to you. No, I love that, and I refer to it as the dam wall uh, breaking scenario. You either let a river run and it trickles on as the yen did, or you dam it up and you hold it artificially at a level, but at the end of the day, it's going to the sea and it goes a whole bunch faster, a whole bunch quicker when you do the dam wall because the dam wall breaks uh, and then the pressure's too much. So it's a very, very valid uh, point. And I would further to add to Brent's point saying, the longer they disproportionately hold a mispriced and they don't let markets uh, pricing mechanisms work, the greater the subsequent move. Now, don't forget, this has been a 40-year peg, but the pressure really is coming on now. So it just becomes a bigger, they store up a bigger move because they'll have less resources, they'll be leaner, uh, and they'll, they'll be complete capitulation. So in that sense, a strategic withdrawal early is smarter. And I'm betting that the Chinese and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority are potentially smarter than what the Euro-Swiss uh, franc SNC B performance showed that holding a 1.5 was always ridiculous. They let it go. Holding a 1.2 eventually saw them got leaned. You just keep storing troubles up and it ends up costing you a whole bunch more. Um, so that is that is almost, uh, you've, you've hit the nail in the head by highlighting that point. This is how you're bringing to um, highlight essentially what we're thinking is coming. Also, for people that just understand some of the basics, the carry trade is the difference between the Hong Kong international high ball and the dollar, which is LIBOR for now, although that is also put under pressure to, uh, to pivot away from LIBOR uh, as well. There's the geopolitical uncertainty we've touched on, the financial center, stark revenue, just a, a data point for everyone. Half year to 2022, IPO listing revenue is one-tenth of what it was the, uh, previously for the same half year. So the financial center as a revenue point is just not there anymore. And people are voting with their money. Who wants to list their equity in Hong Kong with that level of uh, in instability? This is key because... IPOs is a key way that Hong Kong would get capital from the rest of the year or from the rest of the world. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and, and in order to maintain the peg, they need capital inflows to continually replenish the reserves. If, if, if IPO listings are down 90%, that capital from the rest of the world is not coming in and replenishing the reserves that are being spent to defend the peg. Brilliant and absolutely correct. And well done for underlining that. And the other point that I only recently really thought about or learned from others uh, through reading materials around this is the liquidity reduction within Hong Kong that the cost of defending the peg does. 
because from May 11th through to late July, the Hong Kong Monetary Fund bought uh, 172 billion of Hong Kong dollars, 22 billion in US, shrinking the balance of Hong Kong dollars liquidity amongst uh, banks too. So you're actually getting a reduction in liquidity in their own nation state, if we were to call it. Right. I think it should be deemed a province of China more than a nation state. That's almost inevitable. But that's a, uh, that liquidity effect leads us on their own housing, super uh, housing rates, wow, in Hong Kong. They were very, very overblown. The tighter the liquidity pushes up the local Hong Kong borrowing rates. So they then get a massive lean on the housing prices in Hong Kong. One of the most speculative assets, I would say, in terms of what I've read in China, what's gone on, and a small sidebar on Evergrande, they were taking deposits and taking payments for property just off land, bank, that they'd done a brochure of development. And that money, instead of utilizing it for building, they were securing further land banks with. And you've actually seen bank runs and people reluctant to pay any further payments on uh, Chinese property on the basis that there wasn't any building going on. Um, so now people are holding back the funding and the Chinese are now trying to coerce the banks into lending. You've had 86 provinces with bank runs uh, going on with people queuing outside. So people don't understand because it's not in your daily feed, the extent of pressure. China has gone and done a magnified version, if that was even possible, of the GFC property boom yeah. that the West did. Only yeah, exactly. the leverage and the skullduggery and the corruption is X level up. So the scale of the downdraft that they face for creating the heat in our post-GFC uh, global economy is absolutely extreme. Then you've got the zero COVID policies. This has been highly economically destructive, no matter what you think regarding the pandemics. Uh, you've got a massive amount of bare planets all aligning. You've got Hong Kong resident departures. So you've got a situation, zero COVID type policy, very restrictive, businesses in trouble, people can't move around near as much. They continue to weigh on the economy, hurting your employment, low financial services revenues, low IPOs. On top of that, an over, overvalued property sector under pressure from people leaving. So you've got a sales cliff, an overhang. Um, you've got uh, political reasons of people wanting to be out of there. That's con further contributing to a steady ongoing stream out of there, plus an environment where local interest rates are going to go significantly higher because of protecting the peg as well. They're reducing liquidity. This is just a, a catastrophe of events. It's called the bear planets all aligning for me. Um, and then uh, to Brent's point that he brought out earlier, um, almost stealing some of the thunder of this, but I'm a great believer it's not official until it's officially denied. And the Hong Kong's de facto central bank, Eddie Yu, said the peg has worked very well for 40 years and there's no plans to change it. And that rang the bell for that very point that Brent made um, about the Swiss National Bank in December, just before Christmas, saying it was central to their policy and then walking within three and a half weeks. The 14th of January, the peg failed in 2015 uh, after saying in late December 14 that it was central to their policy. So the fact that he has to comment is the indicator, not the content yeah. of what he says. He talks his book and, and serves his masters. So that content is always going to be in that line. But the fact that he needs to comment is your indicator of stress. Some other points. Uh, Hong Kong should be viewed as a province. Um, the, the statistics, the believability of the statistics, this is a quote not from me, uh, from a number of the sources that I read. I'm sorry I haven't uh, grabbed the name to attribute it correctly. Um, but if you believe the main problems is just zero COVID, the person goes on to say in an overheated property sector, then you probably also are believing that the Chinese economy expanded by 4.8% in the first quarter, despite having a closed Shanghai state, large parts of the economy. So if you're thinking an economy is growing 5% nearly, uh, uh, with one of its most important hubs uh, shut down, then you'll probably believe anything. So there's a massive amount of talking, everything's cool, everything's cool. Very much the no shame way of uh, Chinese culture. It's not about bleeding your guts and saying, yeah, we're in deep trouble and here's all the places where we're in deep trouble. And that's almost a cultural uh, element. Um, you know, we might be harsh and call it dishonesty. It's more about holding the line uh, in terms of some things. The extreme lending spree, Chinese companies have relied on credit growth just to get to it. And it's been extreme, as I've already given the example on Evergrande and all the others similar. The country's property sector could be considered bust. They need lending just to not collapse now, not to maintain the rate of expansion, right. just to stay afloat. 
and it's being denied. The banks are saying, well, how are we saving the property industry at our own demise? We'd rather save ourselves. So this is the great collapse. Somebody's got to go down um, because they've obviously overextended. The demographics are terrible. Um, this is more about China, but it will have a small effect on Hong Kong as well. So their numbers, they, they have, have topped out. It's a difficult to get growth. Demographics don't work. It's kind of a long, uh, a long term uh, point. I want to skip on to the rest of Asia, and I'm sure Brent will come in because he's brought up the yen. One of the key indicators for me of the stress of the Asian region is the USD JPY. As he's already pointed out, that trades freely. We've gone from October 21, from out 107, we topped out at 139. And we've had a pullback and a dollar rest so far. But the main Asian devaluation, as, as the main devaluation candidate, but that actually gives, to a degree, Japan a bit of an export advantage as a manufacturing country. And this puts a lot of pressure on all the other Asian nations in a declining growth environment, in a declining lending environment, in a declining environment of hypervaluation and deflation. So how long can the others let uh, the Bank of J Japan fight for the more slices of a shrinking pie? They, of course, have done yield curve uh, control, which is debt valuation support at the expense of further fiat proliferation. Um, now, we've got a macro setup on the Korea one. I'll be showing you. We've spoken a lot about this. Finally, you see the collapse in tourism regionally uh, for Asia. In my opinion, Japan tourism, I do have a chart for and did get data. And I thank Lynn Alden for that on her Twitter. Quarter one, 2020. Since then, how has it gone? And that's your chart. You've absolutely thrown it down from what looks like about uh, almost 3 million just prior to the major crash, right the way down, bottoming really, really low on the tourism side. Brent, do you have a view on the rest of the markets in terms of tourism numbers? Yeah, you know, I, I, I saw that Lynn posted this yesterday, and it's a great chart, and I'm glad she posted it. Um, you know, we've been tracking the same thing with regards to Hong Kong, and it is essentially the exact same chart. Um, the, the tourist arrivals in Hong Kong have basically gone to, you know, next to zero, um, and, it, and it's not recovering. And uh, again, the reason this is important, perhaps more so for Hong Kong than even for Japan, is that one of Hong Kong's main economic drivers is, is uh, tourism. It's one of the biggest sources of revenue for them. But more importantly than just sources of revenue, it's sources of dollars, right? Yeah. And if nobody is going to okay. Hong Kong and exchanging their dollars for Hong Kong dollars, again, it's just a lack of supply of U.S. dollars, which are needed to maintain the peg. This, I think this is an extremely underappreciated slide, and, and I'm glad you put it on here. Uh, and I'll, I'll just I'll defer back to you at this point. Yeah, I think you 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 were very eloquent there. I don't think I could have said it better. Uh, the the shortage of dollars, uh, in essence. So that was the USD JPY. That was a trade we had on through our community. 110 to 136 was our target. You actually traded 139 at the high. The, I'm going to earmark this particular pair for people watching for the pe the peg failure, because. This has had a pullback post its initial target. It did an immense amount in a very short time. Actually, you could have got in October and you would have been out, uh, you know, about a month ago, uh, around June, in fact, uh, early June. So that's more than a month now, actually. Um, and you would have had the better part of what looks like around 25% move on a major pair. After the Euro USD, the USD yen is one of the most significant FX pairs. And that is a substantial move. Uh, and that is... Uh, a very important economy, and as Brent has already highlighted, one not with a peg. This is quite possibly a, a proxy for what should be happening to the Hong Kong dollar and others um, that uh, because of the intervention, when that dam will burst, will actually lead to an even more significant potential move um, on that. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in again. If you, uh, if you were to look back at 2013 and 2015, um, when the yuan, the Chinese yuan weakened um, in 2013, and then again when they did their mini deval in 2015, both of those events were preceded by the yen weakening. So the, the, the yen, the U.S. dollar yen cross is an extremely important um, signpost or flag or signal to, to keep an yeah. eye on. Canary in the gold mine for the fear trade. I've always referred to the USD JPY on the FX side as a canary in the gold mine. And I think you're reiterating uh, that point very eloquently as well.
Korean one, very interestingly set up technically, and we've come on to Real Vision before and said it's our express opinion at some point this one will be letting go. There's a lot of dynamics that are specific to Korea, but there's a lot of that are common with many other places. We don't have time for it in this particular instance, but we have a very big ask for you know 2,300, and we, we you know we were broke, deemed a broken trade. The trade had taken out a new level at 1,250 and at 1,300 that hadn't been seen since uh, 2011. So from this point, the last time you're above 1300, 2009, the, you know, the very, the very bottom of a very nasty period. Since then, we were super stimulus. We are now back above that rate. And this is very much a rounded bottom. And it's in an even bigger squeezing structure uh, on the Korean one. So we expect big things there as well. So the, the Korean one could be a late yen. There's no peg here. This will once again, start to make the Hong Kong dollar peg look a very lonely place uh, if it is still maintained at that point and we go any further on the Korean one. So the whole region, we're talking about an Asian FX crisis, but I've also spoken about a Euro, Euro crisis. The antithesis to that is it's a dollar strength period for which is causing major ructions on Western friendly nations in all the geopolitical major zones. Um, and that is uh, in essence part of uh, Brent's dollar milkshake theory. I want to talk about the USD part, and I think Brent's going to be really active in here as well. Um, we've spoken a lot about Hong Kong and China and some of the things that have gone wrong um, there, the peg drivers, uh, but the international, the US and the Fed. We've had Bullard make some incredibly hawkish statements on inflation. We've essentially seen a recession effectively be denied um, on account of strong labor uh, markets. This will reassert dollar strength if they continue to hold this pose. And it's almost like Wall Street and the risk on guys are calling the Fed's bluff. What if they hold the pain uh, button in a little deeper than many expect? Uh, we could see further reassertion at some point, I'm not saying tomorrow, uh, of the dollar. Um, on that point, in terms of labor participation and the strong labor markets, it seems they're almost ignoring labor participation rates. And they're going with, no, the non-farm number of half a million is good. This means we're super strong. It proves what we are saying. And I'm going to give a couple of Bullard's uh, points here. And Brent is welcome to jump in. Um, we're going through the data very carefully, he says here. And I think we'll get it right. So that to me means trust us. In the pink box, the U.S. economy is not in a recession, he says. It's hard to say there's a recession with flat unemployment rate at 3.6%. Uh, it's hard to say there's a recession. I would argue the participation rate explains that, but it's kind of a recession and denialism in there. And then in the green box, well, I'll get positive GDP growth in the second half. So he's talking a booming um, or at least a strong economy, if not booming, in the second half of the year. We'll have a reasonably good third quarter here. And I think jobs will also hold up over the second half, et cetera. So everywhere green shoots to come. Um, in terms of that. That mentality is not a dovish mentality on the dollar. Brent, you come on in on that. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to think that, uh, you know, I get accused a lot of focusing on the dollar and perhaps overly focusing on the dollar. But I really think if you don't get the dollar right, you're not going to get pretty much anything in macro right. Um, maybe I'm overstating that slightly, but I, I don't think by too much. Um, and I think one thing that a lot of times when we look at the dollar or we look at monetary policy, we think of it in economic terms because that's what they're supposed to do. But one thing I would say that people need to understand is that the dollar is potentially the greatest geopolitical tool that the U.S. as the global hegemon has. And through economic means, they can wield the dollar as a weapon that is in many ways just as powerful, but perhaps less uh, physically lethal <laughs> yeah. to, to some of our adversaries. And, and I think that it's being used that way this year. I think, yeah. uh, you know, I think when you consider whether the, the U.S. wants a strong dollar or a weak dollar, you shouldn't just focus on the economics. I think you should focus on the geopolitical. And with the bifurcation of uh, global sovereigns, you know, we've got the East versus West, China versus U.S., Russia versus U.S., Russia versus Europe, however you want to define that, I think sides are being chosen. And yeah. I think uh, each side is trying to shore up their team. And by the, by, by the U.S. getting a strong dollar, putting some of these marginal countries in a in a in a position of uncomfort, they can shore up their team and provide some some help, but with some strings attached. And uh, um, I think some people may think that's a conspiratorial view, but I think it's a real world, real politic view. And, and I think it should not be ignored. 100%. I'd go along uh, with that. 
Just on the peg fail, the key issues here, it's a 40 years to the good, 480 months without a failure. So this is a long shot we're coming in at. Um, we are saying we are going to get it right. A, it's going to happen, which some people, you could argue it may not ever happen. Um, I would argue most pegs in there inevitably will come under some duress. Um, we are calling long shots. So to say that by the end of March, it's essentially not much more than six and a half months. Uh, the end of Q1, uh, 23, it'll be broken or substantially revised, which will be part of lead to further follow-up attacks, in my opinion, if that were to happen. It's a bit like a dam wall bursting, but you build another one just uh, you know, a couple of hundred meters further on down. Um, it's going to come under similar stress. Just You just bought a, a little bit of time at great cost. Um, China could protect it with its reserves if it's so felt. But when you look at the domestic issues that they have on their own banking system, their own property system, much of which is uh, prevalent in Hong Kong on the overvalued property and the flight capital and people leaving and it's losing its status as a hub, I, I assume to Singapore's benefit, the real malaise, I don't think it really serves them. And actually acting early would be smart. So if we had to credit them with some nous, it should be a tactical retreat point uh, that they should take on early before they squander too many dollars. So we're not the first, however, to actually have tried to call a peg. It's a very, very difficult game. I know Kyle Bass has been talking about the Hong Kong peg for a number of periods from 2019 onwards and onwards, and it hasn't happened. Um, some will say that's a failure. It could just be a case of being a tad early. Maybe it means the same to other people. So why now? Why am I uh, bringing forward this particular thing? What makes me think that the opportunity could be closer than we think? We've called a long stop date for the end of quarter one of 2023. But actually, deep down, I think there's a small possibility it could come sooner. So first, let's look at the potential of the trade. Why is it even interesting? Why are we discussing it? What could you get? Uh, it's highly speculative, as I've said, and non-advised. But the first time, geometrically, you went from 4.5 back in 78. It took three years. It's important to remember the whole period was uh, quite a while. Um, this is not, I expect, to be the same way in the future. I think it'll be even more violent and a lot shorter. But nonetheless, just so that you're aware, you were from the very low point. There was a three-year time frame to the blow-off high. I've done two geometric targets. Is the juice worth the squeeze? There's carry costs involved. Uh, this could be a, a, a trade that takes a while, even if you just hold until the end of Q1. How much would you get? Where are those targets? The more conservative target, which just takes a percentage from the lows to the bottom end of the range, that's the blue line. These two blue lines are the current peg range that it's allowed to bounce around in. That would take you to a potential gain of 13.11. That sounds far out when you're looking at 7.85 now. In percentage terms, on an FX pair, it's huge. Uh, the, the maximum, the beefiest one to this blow off high that actually occurred projected from the top of the range. So this is kind of a parenthesis that I'm giving you I would is 14.89. So somewhere between the 13 range and possibly just sub 15 could be a very interesting level for taking some profits off uh, were this to occur. Again, remember, long shot pegs are hard. Key and key other point that I want to highlight is that it is getting volatile out there. So traders are pricing in a greater implied volatility in the Hong Kong US dollar exchange rate. So there is some smoke. We're not chasing looking for fire in the complete absence of, of any validation. And the volatility uh, is, uh, is suggesting that and you'll pay more for your options. But is it really punitive? I don't think so for the potential gain. It's not super high. Then we're dropping a, a lower time frame, to pretty much to current. And I want to highlight this key point. Technicals are about timing, if nothing else. Yes, you can do awesome things on the big time frames as well. But I'm on a daily, or in fact, slightly under daily, my apologies, 10 hour on this. And I'm highlighting the cap peg at 7.85. These orange boxes will be areas of continued requirement to dump dollars and support the Hong Kong dollar. In other words, these red arrows are perpetual periods of aggressive selling of the US dollar and purchasing of the Hong Kong dollar, which is having a rates-based effect on their property market. It will push deeper into recession in Hong Kong. And this period from July 11th, so I'll just take another box just to show you where I'm talking about. It's almost been nonstop, bar a small dip uh, below over here. This is what I call squeezing up against the ceiling. 
Real hard work is being done here, and the rate of burn is accelerating while we are atop here. Many people doing projections, calculations, as Brent mentioned, not all the collateral that is mentioned in the Hong Kong Monetary Authority's reserves is highly liquid. At some point, one of two things will happen because we are getting a squeeze on the volatility. In other words, there's a trapping of the ping pong ball between the bat and the table where the table currently is the 7.85. One of two things will happen. A, you get a breakout or they shove, uh, they run all stops and they throw a whole bundle in it to try take people off the scent of the peg failure. That is short-term tactics. It's expensive. It would cause additional level of burn. They might get to run a few technical stops that were maybe placed here. Um, and if you're holding on the trade, you might get washed out. Um, but in the longer run, the move to, for me is only going to be to the upside. However, this little upside ascending HVF, as we call it, and many people call it a technical triangle with a flat top, could belie a triggering event that could preemptively occur well before the date I have given you. Again, this is uh, high risk uh, trading against the peg where there's a lot of politics involved and a lot of things could indeed happen. You would need to have stops. The carry cost of the trade um, is substantial uh, and probably due to grow higher. Well, Francis, I can't uh, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with me today. This is a trade uh, that, that I've been uh, involved in for a while and, uh, and I believe strongly in. And I, I think it's also a great opportunity just to educate people, you know, how currency pegs work, how they could potentially fail and the things to kind of look out for if that would be the case. And I, th I think you've done a fantastic job of, of demonstrating um, how this is done. So so thank you very much. Absolute pleasure. And this is something we do in our community at themarketsniper.com. If you like it, come and find out about us. Thanks for having me on, guys. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing professional insights like what you just watched, head over to realvision.com and get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Join our community of lifelong learners.